Welcome, everybody. We are so glad to have you with us this morning for a virtual animal meet and greet. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Rachel, and I work with the education team at the Natural History Museum. As you can tell, I'm not at the museum right now. I'm at home, like many of you, but we do have some amazing staff that still need to go into the museum to help take care of all the living animals that call the museum home. Some people are surprised to learn that the museum even has live animals, but we do have over a hundred species of living animals that are in places like our nature lab, the new Bugtopia exhibit in the Discovery Center, and some that live behind the scenes. So if you'd like, grab a piece of paper and a pencil so you can record your experience while you're watching today. You can note down any of those questions you have, maybe a few facts that you've learned, or draw or write a description of what the animals look like. So let's get started. I'm gonna switch our camera over to Leslie so we can meet some of our live animals and you'll see me again in a little bit. Hey, Leslie. Hi, everybody. Really happy to be with you today. I have got some really cool live animals to share with you, but I thought it might be fun to kind of talk about one of the coolest places in Los Angeles, if not the nation or the world, which is the La Brea Tar Pits. I bet some of you have been to our sister museum, the La Brea Tar Pits. That's what it looks like right there. And what happens there is something that is so special and so unique on this earth that we're really lucky to live near it. What's happening there is urban science, okay? This is real science that's happening in Los Angeles, okay? This is paleontology too. So paleontology being the study of fossils, either a plant or animal, and it's happening right in Los Angeles, not, you know, just dinosaur hunters out in the middle of the, the Wyoming or something like that. Uh, that's what most people think of when they think of paleontology. It also happens right here in the city. These are city scientists finding fossils from 10, 20, 30,000 years ago. Okay, so what these fossils are doing is putting together a puzzle, a picture of what life was like in the Cenozoic, okay? Um, it's almost like looking at your window and seeing this. <laughs> it is really cool to imagine what life was like, but how do we know? How do we know what the weather was like? How do we know what the plants were like? How do we know who lived there? So uh, we're gonna go back to that same slide again, and show you what the tar looks like. Okay, so the tar pits that the tar pits get their name from, the tar, uh, it's actually called asphalt, but we're going to go ahead and just use the word tar today. We'll talk about the difference another day. It's this sticky, gooey, gooey stuff that oozes up out of the earth and caught animals in the tar for hundreds, tens of thousands of years, probably hundreds of thousands of years, and still does today sometimes. And what happens is over time, it gets hard and concretized, really rock hard. And our paleontologists, like on the right, their job is to dig out each and every fossil that they can find through this hard, rock hard asphalt. It's pretty incredible. Now, what are they finding? Of course, the most famous fossils from the Brea Tar Pits are the big dramatic ones. The, the next photo shows you the woolly mammoths and mastodons and the saber-toothed cats and the giant sloths and the bears. And the, we even had a great big lion here that was bigger than our mountain lions, pretty incredible. But you know, there's other animals too. Uh, there are lots of fossils that are in between all those big fossils and they are the micro fossils. So come back to me for a second, Rachel, because I wanna talk about the stuff in between. Those little bitty toe bones of a lizard or the tiny spore of, of a fern can tell you so much. Like what, what can it tell you? Well, some animals, especially the little ones and many plants have to have certain environment to live in or they can't survive. And I bet you knew this already. Actually, for example, um, where do you find a cactus? I bet many of you know that they're found in the desert, right? So uh, anybody know where ferns are found? You don't find them in the desert usually. They're found in moist places, down by rivers, streams. So just finding 
a certain kind of plant can tell you so much. So the little bitty, itty, 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 teeny, tiny fossils mean a lot too. They give us a window, right? Because those, those woolly mammoths weren't like taking selfies or anything like that. What our paleontologists have to do is put the puzzle together, all the different things they find to try to figure out the environment. So I'm gonna share some of the teeny tinies that were found from 10, 20, 30,000 years ago. And all these animals are still alive today. Isn't that cool? There must be something cool about them if they're still around, right? I'm gonna start with an animal that you might've seen when you're out on a hike. This is, let's see if I can get it to not focus on my face. Let me get out of the way. This is a darkling beetle. Aw, isn't he cute? Now, this is a little bit different than the one that lives around here because, uh, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> we didn't have any of the natives on hand, but they look a lot like this. I'll show you a picture of one in a second. These little guys are detritivores, detritivores. So um, what we're going to do is look at each little animal's life and see what we can learn about the past from looking at their life today. All right, so these little detritivores like to kind of toot around and use their antenna to find things in the leaf litter, okay? Leaf litter, uh, which is where leaves fall to the ground or under branches. Um, they like to find, well, any vegetables. They would eat fruits. They would eat carrion, which is meat, dead animals, whatever they can find. So they're pretty versatile in that way. Right, they can go. Uh, they can go a lot of places, and they can eat a lot of things. They also have a really cool little uh, metamorphosis. I bet you've heard the word metamorphosis before. Uh, and this next slide shows uh, a little bit about what that looks like. Uh, so that's the one you might have seen when you're out on hikes, the darkling beetle. And when they get nervous, they kind of stick up their hind end and spray kind of a stinky little smell that hopefully deter predators, uh, but it's more likely, like only birds really would be to, uh, okay to eat that stinky smell. Um, it really bothers a lot of other animals. So that's a good protection. But when they're small, when they're young, they actually are called, they're called mealworms, but they're grubs or larvae, very similar to butterflies. They start out life as these tiny little worms, which I'll show you in a second. And then they metamorphosize into the pupa on the left. How cool is that? That is the same thing as a butterfly pupa. It just looks like a little alien there sleeping <laughs> in the soil. So let's come back to me and I'll show you some of these little guys. This is the baby, the teeniest, tiniest little grub, worm, mealworm, as you could imagine. So these are important food source for a lot of animals, okay? Because they're kind of delicious. They're soft, they're edible. They don't spray that stinky smell. Now I actually have one here that's just about ready to pupate. So it really doesn't want me to pick it up too much. Captions are kind of blocking. I can't tell if I'm focused, hopefully I am. There we go. He's all curled and he's about ready to pupate and turn into that cool little alien creature. So when they're small, when they're worms, when they're the pupa, that's when they're delicious to a lot of other animals. I'm gonna share with you one other little creature who might be found tooling around on the ground. I have got this one. A tree frog, a California tree frog. I need to focus on the frog, there we go. Hey. <laughs> this is Paul Quiet. He'll, he'll climb up in just a second, there we go. You might have seen these guys when they're out uh, hiking around in our creeks and our waterways. It's especially where you find these animals. Now, when a, when a paleontologist comes across a fossil of a frog, you know, uh, this is a frog skeleton, but it doesn't look like this when they find it. They have to look at every teeny, tiny, little, oh, look, there's a toe bone. There's a bunch of bones right here in this toe. So if they find one teeny tiny little bone, they have to determine what that's from. So it's, you know, pretty hard job. They have to have very sharp eyes. So that's how they might know frogs are there. Or the beetles, like I mentioned. 
these guys don't have bones, but they have elytra, which is the word for their wing covers. So that might be what the scientist has to figure out what it is. They might think, oh, oh it's a, I'm going to come across it. I think it's just a leaf or a stuff. Piece of a bark. Piece of bark. But the paleontologists are really good at this. They know what they're seeing. So it's, you know, every toe bone tells a tale. I'm not sure if it says that. Every toe bone tells a tale. Um, what does it tell us, though? Okay, so first of all, how do these um, little guys even get stuck? Okay, um, real quick, let's talk about the amphibian life because I think a lot of you know that they have a metamorphosis too. Where do they start out? How do they start out life? What do they look like? I bet you know. Um, most people immediately say tadpoles, which is true. Look at that adorable little tadpole right there. Uh, they are so cute and they live in the water. They start out life in the water. And water is crucial to amphibians, but a lot of people don't realize they actually, even before tadpoles, they start out as eggs. These beautiful um, egg strands and egg sacs, that's the next photo, which will be floating in the water, and they'll hatch out of there and be little tadpoles living in the water. And even adults need to be near the water because frogs and toads, they breathe and drink through their skin. So they have to have water around. So how would, do you suppose, the frogs, the toads, the beetles get stuck in the tar? Hey, Leslie, well, sorry to interrupt real quick. Do you mind if you hit the mute button and then unmute yourself? The sound got a little wonky and I wonder if it just needs a little reset. Okay. We'll try that. Thanks to our students for um, mentioning that in the chat. Okay, is that any better? That's way better. Thank you, Leslie. Okay, good. Sorry about that. I had a fan on too. We'll see if turning that off helps. So uh, we were wondering how a frog or a toad or a beetle might end up getting stuck in this tar in the asphalt. Well, the next photo shows kind of what it could look like. So yeah, sometimes it's bubbly and black and ooey and gooey, but you also notice that leaves can fall on top of it. You know, this seeps right up out of the earth. It still does to this day. And so, um, you know, it's just part of the landscape. So leaves will fall on it and dust will fall on it. Um, and on the right, you can see water might fall on it. And it looks a lot like a little pond, right? We, um, we might look at that and go, oh, that's got an oil slick. or Oh, it smells kind of strange. But the animals might not realize it. So they might go down to the water to try to lay their froggy eggs or to, you know, call out to the females to come down to the water, which is what the males do. Um, and so that's how they might get stuck. Same for the beetles. They might be looking around for food, uh, walking around on the ground and end up stuck. Okay, so what does, come back to me here, what does it tell us about the environment back then to have beetles, to have frogs? What can it tell us? What can it tell our paleontologists? Well, we said they start out in the water, right? And they need the water to survive. They breathe and drink through their skin. They have to have moisture. So that tells us back then there was some moisture, right? It tells us that there was water. Maybe it was streams, maybe it was ponds, but there was definitely some kind of water around because all these animals that really rely on the water, they were there, right? We know that. So, you know, like I said, it's really hard to put a picture together without knowing what the animals that lived then really needed. Um, another animal I've got to share with you. Oh, the next picture we have to show um, just points out that there were frogs and toads back then. And toads tend to like drier, uh, slightly drier habitats and they can survive in the desert. But the fact that there were tree frogs and toads tells me that it was pretty moist because tree frogs don't like the desert. Tree frogs really like a little bit more moisture. So that's kind of cool. This fossil record is really kind of giving us some, some secrets, some clues about what life was like. The next animal, the photo I'm gonna show you, I bet you will recognize right away, are the pond turtles. The Western pond turtles are California's only 
freshwater turtle. They're very special little guys. Now, a lot of people think that turtles like to live in the water and they, they don't live in the water, but they hunt in the water. Can you see how he's hanging out right above the tree branches and he's ready to dive in when trouble comes and he also might hunt in there. So here we go. This is Poppy, the Western pond turtle who would definitely like to hang out. Here we go. Isn't he the cutest? These, now this is kind of a big one. <laughs> um, the kind of, the size of their shell, a lot of times in the wild is more like this size, the smaller size, which I'll show you more in a second. I wanna make sure Poppy gets support here. So Poppy, like I said, they might hang out on a branch over the water and hunt for fish or worms or even snakes and sometimes vegetation. So they're real versatile in what they eat. But again, they have a clue for us. All three of these animals I showed you are ectothermic, which means the temperature around them determines their body temperature. So that means it was warm at some point of, of the season in this area. It couldn't have been frozen all the time. This was the end of the ice age. It was frozen all the time. These animals wouldn't be around. So we know that there were reptiles and amphibians and, and insects. So it must have been a pretty pleasant, pretty warm, at least for part of the year, um, habitat. Now, one last creature to show you. There we go. Oh, and of course, how did those turtles end up stuck in tar? Well, remember, we talked about how they like to hang out over water, and we showed you the picture of that stream that where the water had covered up over the tar. Now, these animals might also go down to the water. This is a rosy boa. <laughs> Get him in focus here. His name is Percival. Very sweet little guy. There were lots of snake fossils found at the La Brea tar pits. Lots of different kinds. Now, um, here's what the life of a snake looks like really quickly. They like to slither around looking for food. Okay, you know, they eat all different kinds of meat and they use their tongue to find the food. They flick their tongue. And and it's got a fork on the end of it there to help spread out and find more food. They can look in a lot of different environments. Um, the next picture shows you how they could be crawling through the grass and be pretty well camouflaged because they might have stripes or spots. They can even climb trees. There's one climbing up to check out a bird box. They can climb, they can dig, they can go in a lot of different environments. This next picture is the kind of environment Percival might be found in. You can see how beautifully he camouflages in the, in the, the granite and the, the sandstone around Los Angeles. So actually, I'm going to let Percy here climb behind me and explore a little bit on my little snake climber. It's very cute. We can go back to the picture, well, go back to the animals now. This is, uh, I'll show you how they can climb around, use their muscles, and use their strong bodies to go to a lot of different environments. So maybe that, we can't find out exactly what um, the weather was like because they're found in a lot of different places, but we do know it was warm enough for them to survive. That's one thing we know. Uh, we also know that there was probably a lot of food around. If there are snakes, they gotta have food. And in particular, this is kind of cool. The um, snakes that are mostly found in the pits are garter snakes, which tend to like to hunt, again, in water. They like to hunt in water. So if there's garter snakes there, that means there's probably water. Pretty cool, right? And rattlesnakes too. Now they don't hunt in the water so much, but they really like to eat rodents. And when there's a lot of moisture around, there's a lot of plants. And so the rattlesnakes do really well. So maybe that's got something to do with it. All of this is us guessing, putting pieces together, right? We're putting tiny toe bones or, or turtle shells together and trying to um, make a hypothesis, which is sort of an idea that we can back up with our research, trying to learn more about each animal that we find there, which gives us a window into um, what life was like back then. So I wanna thank you guys so much for joining me and. 
um, looking at all the different creatures that are still alive today, that have been around for tens of thousands of years, at least in this region. Um, some of them have been on Earth for 150,000 years. So there must be something pretty cool about them. Um, okay, so I'll be happy to take some questions now. Awesome, thank you so much, Leslie, and all of the animals that made an appearance in today's presentation. Um, I'm gonna kind of go through, we had a couple of specific questions about some of the animals. So I'll ask a few of those to start off. Um, Caitlin was curious, how long do those um, adult darkling beetles live and how old, if you happen to know, is our oldest beetle that we have in the collection? <laughs> yeah, you know, honestly, we have these darkling beetles here so that they can have babies so that we can use those babies for food. So we don't keep a whole like super close track of these particular animals. Um, they tend to live um, a few months, but to be honest, I don't know for sure what their entire lifespan could be. Uh, many insects don't live all that long, but I'm sorry, I don't have the exact answer to that one. We'll have to do some research on our own for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, Melanie was curious, um, how big can those tree frogs get that you showed us earlier? This is it. Aren't they adorable? This is it. This is how big they get. <laughs> you might find these guys when you're out um, hiking in Eaton Canyon or nearby. They like to hang out over the water, just like the turtles do. <clears throat> Camouflaging beautifully, <coughs> excuse me, beautifully on the rocks. So they'd be really hard to see, but they, you know, you look for something about that big when you're out there hiking around. And you might be able to hear them, right? If you're listening at a certain oh, point. Of day. course, thank you so much. Yeah, especially towards the evening or nighttime. If you can't see them, you listen for them because they're the ones making a racket out there. A beautiful chorus. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Henry was curious, how do frogs adapt to living on the land and in the water? Yeah, it's kind of cool. The name amphibian means dual life, two lives they have. So they start out as these little eggs just kind of floating around and then they wiggle out as little tadpoles and they're breathing with gills. They're breathing underwater with gills just like a fish, which, you know, the gills help take oxygen out of the water, okay? So they're swimming along. But at some point in their life, everything changes so dramatically. They start to get these, they start to exercise these lungs that they were uh, developing. The legs start to stretch out of their body. The tail starts to disappear up into the body and everything starts to change. Pretty soon they're gonna swim to the surface and breathe air real air for the first time. So it's all part of their process where the body changes to get ready. They even eat different food as tadpoles from adults. Tadpoles are herbivores and the adults are carnivores. How cool is that? I mean, they're so different when they're born. It's kind of amazing. That is totally oh, amazing. amazing. That reminds me of a relevant question. You kind of just hinted at it, but Isaac and uh, Melody were curious about what those tree frogs like to eat. So maybe it, it's different when they're younger as when they're adults. Yeah, yeah. The tadpoles will eat algae and vegetation. And, and when they, probably because, so, so that the adults don't compete with the young, they have such a different life. So the adults will then leave the water and come out and eat whatever they can catch. Bugs, flies, worms, whatever they can catch. Big, big frogs will eat other frogs. They'll eat snakes, they'll eat birds. So uh, whatever a frog can fit in its face is what it's gonna eat. Wow, that is so wild. Uh, let's see, uh, we had a couple questions about Poppy. Um, Caitlin was wondering how much does Poppy weigh and how old is Poppy? Oh, I don't know Poppy's weight offhand, but I want to say he's probably just a couple of pounds in that. It's not as heavy as you might uh -oh. think. Oh, yeah. Strong. Your oh. audio is going in and out a little bit again. If you maybe could do that little click and sure, sure. thanks, Leslie. Is that better? Can we hear yeah. me now? Thank okay. 
sure. So this is Poppy. Again, um, he's not as heavy as you might think. He's probably only a couple of pounds. I don't have his weight right in front of me. Um, but these guys can live a long time. They can live, you know, 30, 40, 50 years up there. So they, they have what's known as indeterminate growth. They'll keep growing, but they're not going to get gigantic. He's just going to keep getting a little tiny bit bigger and, and stronger. So when you see a big turtle, you know they're pretty old for the most part. What was the second part of that question? Oh, it was the, the age and the weight. So you, you covered oh, okay. it. <laughs> okay. A couple of questions about um, Percival, the rosy boa. Uh, Melody was wondering, is the rosy boa venomous? And Amelie was curious, why is it called a rosy boa? Um, they are not venomous. Um, I would never be picking up a venomous snake with my hands. Not that you would know that, but nobody should pick up a venomous snake with their hands. That's not responsible. Um, but they, um, they're the only venomous snake in this area actually are the rattlesnakes. They let you know they're venomous too, right? They make that rattle. A lot of people think that most snakes are venomous, but it's not true. Most of them are not. Most of them are constrictors, which means they wrap around their prey and give it a big hug because they love it so much. So, um, so they might eat the same food, but they have different ways of catching and ending the life of their prey. And that's all venom is really, it's for their prey. Um, they don't want to use it on people like the, the ones who do have venom. Um, any animal can bite. They bite when they are, I bet you know why a dog bites. They bite when they're scared, right? Or when they're eating something. So uh, I know I saw somebody ask about biting in there. Um, and so, yes, the rosy boa, who is called rosy because she's sort of pinkish, could bite me if she was scared, but I don't scare her. So she doesn't have a reason to bite me. <laughs> she's exploring back there. Actually, it's a male, but he doesn't care what I call him. There we go. <laughs> I love seeing yeah. Percy go. Yeah, that's so neat. That's awesome. Okay, we have time for one more question and it's the hardest question you always get, Leslie. So I hope you're ready, but we have a Dodgers fan who is curious, what's your favorite animal? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I think I change my answer every time I, I get asked this, but I'm really fond of the turtles and tortoises. I think they're just so amazing. They've been around for 250 million years. There's gotta be something great about them. This incredible shell that they carry on the outside of their body it's so unusual. It's so weird in the animal world. They're the only vertebrate that does this, that has their backbone on the outside. So I like the strange ones. That's, that's one of my favorites. And I really like the pond turtles and the, and the desert tortoises, our native species here in California. They're just so cool. They are so neat. Well, thank you so much again, Leslie. This has been so interesting. We've learned so much about animals that were alive at the time of some of our more familiar, maybe Ice Age animals. And um, thank you again for spending time with us today. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Bye, Leslie and Percy. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and close this out of our program today. I know we had a lot of questions and we didn't get to everybody. So I encourage you to write it down um, so you can do a little more research on your own after today's program. But if you want to see more of our live animals, you can give them a follow on Instagram at NHMLA underscore live animals. We'll also have all the videos from these presentations on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. So you can catch this recording and others of other animals that we've met throughout the school year at youtube.com slash NHMLA. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Bye everyone. <laughs>